So thanks everybody for joining. Um, it looks like um, we have a lot of new people um, to finance campaigning. Um, some people who've done some finance campaigning before. Uh, so that's 23% who've done it before, 27% who, who are maybe more experienced in this area. Um, I'm hoping you can see the polls on your screens, uh, the poll results even. Um, great. Um, so yeah, special welcome to all of you. Um, we've got um, a great lineup of uh, speakers um, for this defund fossil fuels webinar. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing this poll. Um, and yeah, I'm going to actually hand over to Robbie Gillett, who's um, who's been the 350 Europe finance campaigner, and he's going to be uh, sharing with us. Um, more about the new report on financial flows on financial flows to gas and coal projects in Europe um, uh, so that we know a bit more about the kind of fossil fuel battles um, that that we have at hand. Thanks, uh, thanks very much Emma. Is it worth just saying as a quick overview for the webinar that each pre um, presentation is going to be around 10 minutes long and we hope to make some space at the end of 15 minutes or so for questions and answers. Um, that's just an overview. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Robbie Gillett. I'm based in Bristol in the UK <clears throat> uh, and I'm a, an organiser with the anti-fracking movement uh, in the UK with Reclaim the Power and also more recently I've been um, doing short stints at 350 publishing and finalising some research into the finance behind big fossil fuel projects in Europe <clears throat> which is the subject of tonight's call. Um, so a quick overview of, of the presentation I'm just about to give, I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk about the new project, the, the new research that we've just uh, published recently, uh, looking at eight fossil fuel projects across Europe. We're then going to look at the strategy and theory of change behind defund work about removing the finance from fossil fuel projects. Then we're going to dive a bit deeper into the data and show some web pages where um, we as campaigners can find some of this financial data that we've produced and then go into a quick list of things to consider if you wanted to start your own defund campaign in the place you live. So that's just a quick overview of what uh, we're going to be chatting about. So I'm just going to share my screen here, hopefully it will work. Uh, bear with me. Um, uh, yeah, and oh, you've probably seen a bit of a mess of different things on my screen, so I'm going to tidy that up. Uh, so I, I didn't prepare, prepare, prepare slides because I wanted to, we've published these web pages that have all the information on them. So part of the, one of the purposes behind this webinar was to kind of walk through um, this information. So uh, the defund work that we've been doing in, in Europe has looked at eight key fossil fuel battles in Europe and whilst it's worth mentioning that whilst we've only listed eight here that was to kind of limit the the range of the research and there are plenty of other important fossil fuel fights that are happening in places not listed here um, but to go through them there are five gas projects and uh, three uh, coal projects so the first one I'll just rattle through them is the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline in Italy we looked into the research uh, to which banks have been financing the companies behind these uh, this this project. Um, so the trans adriatic pipeline runs from Greece through Albania to Italy and it's part of the bigger southern gas corridor bringing gas from Azerbaijan to Europe uh, and there's many people in the south of Italy fighting uh, that pipeline. Another project is the Groningen gas fields where for the last 50 years Shell and ExxonMobil have been drilling uh, for gas and caused many earthquake and uh, damage to people's homes and uh, later this summer, at the end of August, there'll be a mass mobilisation, Cold Road, um, in Groningen, uh, focusing on that subject. Another project that we looked at for this report was the Step Midcap Pipeline, um, a proposed new pipeline between Catalonia and South France. Um, and the companies there are Enegas, GRT Gas and Telega. Um, also looking at the companies proposing to build a new LNG terminal in Gothenburg in Sweden, that's Enegas and Fluxis again. Fluxis are a 
um, a Belgian company owned by the municipality of Ghent, as a quick aside. Uh, and I know that some Ghent campaigners have been looking into that, how they can target Fluxies and put pressure on them already. A uh, fifth project that this research is looking at is fracking in the UK. Uh, and um, companies such as Quadrilla have just been given permission to frack uh, very recently. Um, and other companies such as Ineos, Third Energy and Europa Oil and Gas are hoping to, to run fracking projects as well. And there's been strong resistance to that. Elsewhere in Europe, we looked at the coal, fit, um, coal industries of Poland and companies such as PGE, Energa, Enia, um, and Company of Aglova, who have changed their name to PGG recently, as well as uh, in the Czech Republic, companies such as CZ, Czech, and in Germany, the Rhineland coal fields, the, Europe's largest CO2 emitter, uh, and RWE are the principal company operating there. Um, so that, those are the, those are the, um, the companies that we researched uh, what we did was to approach um, the research group Profundo and ask them to find all the financial loans that had gone to these companies between 2012 and 2017. <clears throat> the idea being that if we could find out who has lent to the, which banks have lent to these companies in the past, then hopefully we, that will give us an idea of which banks will be willing to, would be thinking about lending to them in the future. Um, so what, we, what, what it came up with, Profundo came back with 40,000 bits of financial data and we, it was a very intimidating spreadsheet for sure. We kind of summarized all that information into this table um, as well as some infographics. And I'm, we're gonna dive into this data later, but just to explain this, this table that we have, which is the summary of the, of the research. Across the top here, we have the projects that I just mentioned, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, the Groningen Gas Fields, the Midcap Pipeline, Catalonia, the Gothenburg, proposed Gothenburg LNG terminal, UK fracking, German coal, Polish coal, Czech coal, etc. And down this uh, vertical axis, we have the big banks that have been lending money to these companies. Um, so Barclays, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, BNP Paribas, Societe Generale, Unicredit, Credit Agricole, UBS, Santander, Intesa San Paolo, they're all listed there. <clears throat> we'll dive into that data in more detail uh, shortly. But to go move on to what the strategy is about the theory of change, the theory of change behind um, I might stop sharing my screen for a second so I'll come back into the room. Um, hi. Uh, so the theory of, of defund, what we're asking, what do we mean by defund? Well, it means pressuring, bringing civil society and social movement pressure to bear on the banks that, are fi that have been historically financing fossil fuel projects in Europe and would likely do so in the future and to cut off that finance. Uh, and the idea being there with multiple aims. Um, one is that by removing the finance for new projects, fossil fuel companies can find it harder to attract capital at profitable rates elsewhere. So finance is a key part of the supply chain for new fossil fuel projects. Uh, and the banks aren't just places where these fossil fuel companies keep their money or that will do the odd loan. Some banks will go around to all of the other banks as lead financiers and uh, and ask all the other banks and arrange a bunch of loads so that the, the banks are really working hand in glove with um, some of the biggest fossil fuel companies that are polluting. A second aim or an additional aim to uh, defund work is to act in solidarity with frontline struggles, um, especially when large distances are involved between people who would like to support those struggles and where that fossil fuel infrastructure is taking place. For example, um, many people in Europe are concerned about what's happening with the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline uh, in, in Greece, Albania and Italy and seeing the, the resistance that local communities have put up there and thought, well, maybe people can travel to Italy, but that's it's the southern furthest point of Italy. And sometimes that's very difficult. Uh, so what can we do in the place where we live? Well, often 
there is a bank that is financing those projects. So there is an opportunity with defund work to take action in the town that you live in, in support of a frontline struggle somewhere else. And the information that we've provided in this report hopes to assist that if possible. Uh, and finally, in doing so, if you, uh, and lastly to add on that, we've seen that model uh, work with the defund, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline in the United States, which Chihiro is going to speak about after myself. Um, so that's, you know, that's the model. 350 um, are coming in relatively new to bank finance campaigning. So this is, there's a certain amount of um, trying new things out to see how they go. Um, but we've looked to the past and pulled out a bunch of uh, past uh, past campaigns and inspiring examples of when social movements have won to inform our our thinking on this. So I'll just scroll down. You can read some of these <clears throat> on this web page. Uh, this web page is also available in French, German, and Italian as well. But we looked at Spanish housing movements. We looked at uh, campaigns against BNP Paribas in France and also the Defund Daphne campaign. Cool, so I'm now back sharing my screen again. Uh, okay, so from there, uh, I should be careful where I let my uh, screen rest so it'll be scrolling around. So to get into the data a bit more, um, if uh, you see, for example, if you want to, if you're based in um, the UK, for example, and you wanted to take action in support of the trans Adriatic pipeline, well, on this table, if you click through, hopefully it should uh, load up, all being well. If you were to click through onto that um, screen, there's a whole bunch of more complicated data that you can find there um, on these uh, on these web or these spreadsheets behind that table. So down the bottom here. You can see you've got all the companies that are involved. Um, we've got Axpo, a Swiss company, BP. You can see all the banks here that have uh, lent to BP over the, the last five years between 2012 and 2017. Uh, I'll, I'll go into these now. So we've got other banks that weren't listed on that table. Um, we've got the Royal Bank of Scotland. We've got uh, Credit Suisse. We've got Standard Chartered. Um, so this data set, um, can allow campaigners to to say, well, actually, I'm based in Sweden, for example, uh, and I see here that Nordea Bank has been involved in lending money to Enegas between 2012 and 2017. I'm going to use that information to launch a campaign against Nordea and say, are you planning to finance any of these other companies that are involved in the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline? And there's a consortium of many companies involved, but these are the main ones, Axpo, BP, Enegas, Floxies, SNAM and SOCAR. Okay, so I'll come out of that data table. Um, <clears throat> but just to say that that is all there. So for that detailed spreadsheet stuff is available for each of the eight fossil fuel projects that we've researched. So the Groningen gas field, the Midcap pipeline, the LNG terminal, UK fracking companies, coal Rhineland, Polish coal, Czech coal, etc. So I suppose the difficulty of the job I've been trying to do for the last few months is take that big data set and make it um, like public, like work out how we can use it as international, as campaigners in our country, but also internationally as well. Emma, can I ask you how much time I have left? Just, uh... Yeah, you actually need to be wrapping up there. Oh, sheesh. Okay, right. Um, right, I'll be really quick. I'll try and... Um, try and crack through uh, just to show a few more resources that we've got. I'll just need two more minutes. Um, so that was quite a relatively dry table. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I realize I'm not sharing my screen again. So let me just do that. Uh, Cause there's a couple, there's a few more resources. It's hoping to. So these are available on that same web webpage. Um, we've produced some infographics. So if you wanted to take on Barclays, we've uh, outlined that financial data in um, infographics like this, which show Barclays' relationship with in, uh, frac fracking companies, with German coal companies, with um, Shell and Exxon, etc., and all the projects across Europe. And we've done that for um, 
Santander, for Deutsche Bank, for Intesa Sao Paulo, for Credit Agricole, uh, Unicredit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've also got a bunch of these reports in PDF form. Um, so if you would like me to send your, your group some, like 15 or 20 copies or so, happily do that. I've got them in German, French, Italian, English. Um, so please email Robbie at 350.org and I'll happily send your group some. Okay, last thing to consider um, before I'm, I know I'm over time. Um, it's just there's some questions here. I'm still, still sharing my screen. You're still seeing what I'm seeing. Great. Um, so these are... It's worth, really worth mentioning that taking on the big banks isn't, um, it's something that needs preparation and thought because uh, it's not just a case of picking any bank and any fossil fuel that is fun financing any fossil fuel company and throwing yourself at it. Some preparation and campaign planning um, is definitely recommended because they, they take quite a lot of social movement pressure to budget. So see, these are some questions that are worth considering uh, before uh, beginning something. So what is the frontline fuel, front fossil fuel resistance you would like to support? We've got eight listed there. And are there any banks near you that are financing that project? Uh, for example, um, I showed a Barclays um, infographic there, but uh, Barclays haven't actually been involved in any um, Polish coal companies as far as we're aware. So sometimes the links aren't even there. Uh, so you need to look at which banks near you are involved in that project. Um, do those banks have branches in your in your neighbor, in your town or your city where you could hold protests? This one, number four, is a crucial one. Which other organisations are supporting that fight? Um, maybe there's a there's an NGO in your company in your country that are already working on that subject. Um, and last, I have to wrap up there, but some more. Those infographics are available down at this bottom here and. I'll close there because I know I'm over time. And sorry for speaking so fast. That was a lot to cover. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. Back in the room. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and thanks for giving that uh, very rapid um, overview. Um, I know it's a lot of, a lot of information. Um, so like Robbie was saying, uh, you can access um, all that information that Robbie was just talking about um, via the website, which I posted in the chat. Um, we'll post it again so you can see it um, and you can access it in different languages. Um, if you've got any clarifying questions, um, you can use the Q&A and um, I'm sure Robbie um, can have a look at those now and, and answer them. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'd like to welcome Chihiro um, to share more about lessons from from past campaigns um, that have been have been doing exactly what um, Robbie was describing um, targeting banks um, and Chiriro was um, yeah involved in campaign against ING and ABN in, in Amsterdam um, to defund DAPL um, so lots of acronyms but um, I'll leave Chihiro to explain that <laughs> as best place to explain that thanks Chihiro you will need to un unmute if you haven't unmuted. <laughs> and while she's um, just unmuting, Chihiro will be using a presentation um, that Robbie will be sharing. So if people can't see it um, when, when she begins, then, then let us know via the Q&A. Um, Chihiro, your video has gone and I can't hear you. Oh, no. <laughs> I can hear you, but not see you anymore. So if you're able to switch on your video again, that would be great. But if not, we can actually hear you. I heard that I was unmuted. Is that correct? That's correct. We can hear you. Okay, so maybe you can share screen. Can you share screen? Yeah, Robbie. Robbie's done it. You're good to go. Okay. Awesome. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really excited. Everybody's tuning in from all around the world. Um, so my name is Chihiro and I've been um, a climate activist and also a speaker on decolonizing our climate movement for quite a while. Uh, what I have not been 
um, or what I haven't considered myself to be is uh, somebody uh, working on finance. So really it's interesting how uh, Standing Rock and uh, the movement to divest uh, from Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota has drawn in a lot of activists with many different points of entry. Um, so I'm just going to check uh, to the slides myself now because my screen also disappeared. Are we looking at the first slide? If we're looking at the first, the first slide, we, are. Uh, we see um, Mimi from Mad Mothers, um, who's actually an uh, anti-racist campaigner. And she was the first one in the Netherlands to make a move on um, uh, NL Stands with Standing Rock. There were a lot of people talking about it on Facebook, sharing posts like, hey, there are people in, in North Dakota who are fighting this, this pipeline that is um, basically breaking their, their, their treaty rights. It's uh, uh, threatening their water supplies and they're putting up a fight and putting up um, a camp. And that had been going on for quite some months. So it was interesting to see that the first um, action was just from a regular citizen uh, working on anti-racism and asking me and some others to to speak at the demo and it was a pretty straightforward demo and like making some noise in front of the banks in the Netherlands that are uh, uh, involved in um, in energy transfer um, the, the the funding uh, for the pipeline so um, moving on to the next slide um, we see the Facebook page basically uh, everybody was talking about it. The resistance of Standing Rock was making the news. Um, and the next question was like, how, do, how to do solidarity and how to coordinate it. So um, a couple of different women here, uh, both from the climate movement and from more spiritual groups and just regular citizens heard that call and organized uh, uh, to make a Facebook group. So basically almost every day or um, like sometimes three or four times a week, there would be somebody with an idea to do a water ceremony in front of the bank or to do a direct action or to do a demo or to do noise. And um, so we had diversity of tactics and also diversity of players uh, to do this solidarity work. and. If, if anything, in the beginning, the biggest challenge was like coordinating it. So uh, all these initiators who really heard the call um, could also, yeah, unite. Um, so the next slide. And the next slide, we see one of those water ceremonies in front of uh, the ING bank. Um, so there was also a lot of um, first time uh, testing the water, literally, of how like these spiritual people um, uh, were making way within the climate movement to to be more um, self caring, and on the other hand, uh, for activists to kind of challenge spiritual people who didn't want to be against anything, to kind of recognize the harm and the criminal nature of um, uh, this this pipeline and and the and the uh, energy transfer um, and the violence perpetrated against the locals of the uh, Lakota who are suffering. Um, so the next picture, this is again in front of the headquarters of the ING, which is in a very populated area in the Belmer, which is um, in the southeast of Amsterdam. It's a very uh, mixed uh, uh, race, uh, um, um, like multicultural uh, area. And it was very interesting to do um, lots of um, actions there because everybody knew about Standing Rock and our, our, our biggest um, focus when we did a flyer to, to people was really about, you know, having a call to action about behavior like quit ING Bank, call ING Bank to be outraged drop a line on uh, their Facebook, just basically very confrontational of um, holding them accountable for their criminal acts and really putting the social aspect of human rights uh, uh, front and center. Um, and then uh, of course people were also upset about climate, but I think having the victims and the front line um, be in the center 
also was uh, very good for this no neighborhood to be outraged because uh, yeah the the angle of social justice um, so uh, basically ing's response was first of all sending a friendly polite spokesperson from their communication office and being very very public and very um we are taking all measures and we are in good communication and we are you know just basically saying uh 20 lies in two minutes but saying it with the nicest voice so if you would be recording your actions it looks like wow ing nice nice folks um i should mention that the abn kind of dropped out pretty quickly so all of our focus um, was really going towards ING. Um, and so we also learned from that in our in our actions. Um, so when we confronted the first time, we would have this conversation with the spokesperson from ING. But then the second time, we would kind of anticipate it by not just presenting them uh, uh, a, a bottle of water for the sanctity of life, but also presenting them a bottle of oil so if they would take that, you know, that picture would actually say like, hey, you know, this is, you know, you wouldn't want to drink this. You're being hip, uh, a very, um, like, there's a lot of hypocrisy that we could not, you know, like if we would go into a discussion on that stage, it would just be a lengthy uh, bullshit discussion. So we kind of um, um, took the conversation uh, to other visual cues. Um, so one of those cues would be the next picture where you see a very long, um, a long sheet of paper. It's a roll. We rolled it out in front of the entrance and it was basically a visualization of like, uh, I don't know, like 150 different oil spills that were recent um, taking place, uh, basically showing like what they were constantly saying, this will never happen. Uh, we are being so secure and industry is taking all measures, kind of showing like, no, this happens uh, all the time. And uh, it's not a matter of um, if it will happen, but it's a matter of when it will happen. So by yeah, using action material that was kind of visually um, telling the story of, of, of harm and of um, uh, harm that was a systemic um we yeah we told the story um and one thing that was very exciting is that um so maybe spoiler alert but um the ing did distance itself from uh um the dakota access pipeline after uh, a few months of campaigning uh which is something beyond a lot of our wildest beliefs like oftentimes you feel like you're in this david goliath struggle and you feel like you have to fight because it's so unjust but it's uh, a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of um yeah just seeing what works in this case um we didn't have um very big actions but we had a lot of actions so um i don't know if we're now on the picture uh, just with the six women in front of another ING uh, office, um, which has colonialism inside 1492. Um, this was the first time in the Netherlands that we had um, a narrative which was uh, bringing together uh, anti colonial struggle, anti racism, climate, um, environmental, human rights, spiritual healing, the whole bunch. And what you could see is that it would just really mobilize regular people, uh, old, young, uh, student, uh, uh, people who are not um, in it for the information, but just from the heart. Um, it, it was a really big spectrum of allies. And I think we also, I uh, should probably say that um, because BankTrack had already, it's an organization here in the Netherlands, I think they'll be, uh, speaking later, um, had already done a lot of work on uh, kind of targeting ING for a while for being one of the, well, being the dirtiest boy of the class here in the Netherlands of all the banks. Um, we already had quite some good um, facts and figures at hand to also kind of underline our point. 
uh, and I think um, because the front line was raising the uh, resistance uh, and making the news and making it not go away, uh, we were able to um, have effective protest. We were able to have effective protest because uh, we were making it visible and urgent and immediate and right here right now to the Dutch circumstances but if there wouldn't have been this massive huge fight on the front line uh, we would have never even been able to make them blink because um, ING really is a dirty boy that that does not care so uh, going on on to the huh? I'm yeah. just gonna let you know you just need to start wrapping up um, sure. Yeah. So the final thing is uh, the flyer. Um, so uh, here's one of the flyers that we used uh, in front of the headquarters. It has a picture of Greenpeace uh, action where they made actually a, a pipeline going through the building of the ING headquarters. Like, how do you like it if we would just infringe on your territory? And it was really nice that uh, in this case, in this campaign, nobody got in in each other's way, you know, like the big NGOs and um, the bank track and the uh, fossil free and the rhythm of resistance and the fossil free culture and, you know, like all the different uh, parts and citizens really play together. Um, the other side is the back, which I will leave, um, but it basically, the back of the flyer really uh, underlines the different um, uh, human rights uh, issues around ING. They have a rich profile. And I think which was really ballsy is that we did both actions that were very sweet, like uh, sweet direct actions in front of the building, but also going inside the building with noise, with drumming bands, and um, actually Greenpeace making a pipeline into their building. So I think um, this campaign was really a good example of being a mosquito, mosquito in a tent, you know, like you're small, um, but you can really be obnoxious to this big Goliath uh, giant. Um, and uh, the final slide of the women of Standing Rock and the women uh, raising their hand. I'm in the middle and on the right there's Carmen, uh, Time to Stop Colonization. She was our spokesperson in uh, with ING. And I would just want to say, you know, thanks to her, she really took instructions by the front line. She was really taking the instructions from Standing Rock. She went to Standing Rock, so she really knew how to pressure and be a good ally. Um, so uh, I will leave you with the last slide to read for yourself, which is kind of like a wrap up. But um, that was pretty much it for me. Um, we were raising uh, a campaign focused on behavioral change to quit ING Bank uh, and not so much on awareness because the, the, the front line had already raised a lot of awareness. So it was a topic. We were just pushing it to, to strengthen the waves for change. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Tahiro. Um, what a fantastic overview of um, you covered so many things there, like uh, being able to, like who, who you're taking leadership from uh, in a campaign, um, which voices are those, um, the wide variety of tactics um, and creativity that you brought into the campaigning and um, small but sustained, um, like regular. Um, and yeah, um, fantastic to hear about the success of it as well. Um, it's, yeah, it's something for sure to be celebrating. Um, so thank you for sharing your stories. Um, uh, I believe we're able to be able to share those presentations um, uh, with people. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that can be done. I'm going to check. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, um, we do indeed have Bank Track with us. Um, uh, big welcome to Claire Hamlet, who is here, um, who's going to be giving us more of a um, step back from the, the last two to three years. Um, the battles of against fossil fuel financing. Um, so, for those of you who've maybe been involved for a little while longer, um, it's more of a, a, a deeper insight um, and a broader cross section. So, yeah, welcome, Claire. 
Um, I think you've also got a presentation. Are you okay to share it yourself? Or yep. yep. I'll let me know if um if you can't see it for some reason or anything. So uh, yeah, hi, I'm Claire from Banktrack. We're based in the Netherlands. Um, so I'm a fairly newish climate campaigner there. Um, so as our name suggests, we track bank policies and financing related to energy, environment, and human rights. Um, we also provide, provide support to other NGOs in dealing with banks um, and run our own public pressure campaigns in cooperation with many partners around the world. Um, so one example was the, the Defund Apple campaign. Um, so we've, done, we've been doing this for more than a decade and this year we're celebrating 15 years as bank tracks. So that's quite exciting. Um, so as Emma said in this talk, I'm going to uh, give you a bit of a tour through the recent history of campaigning on fossil fuel finance. So I'll talk about some of the big successes um, and the direction that campaigning is taking now. Um, and I'll also offer some key take home messages about effective campaigning on banks. Um, so one thing I'm just gonna mention quickly uh, is that when I talk about banks, I do generally mean um, private sector banks, um, which we also call commercial banks. Uh, so not development banks such as the World Bank or central banks that gov govern other banks within a country. Uh, so private sector banks would be ones where you put your own money, um, but they could also be pure investment banks such as Goldman Sachs. Um, so, all right, I'll try, I'll try to, can, can you all hear me okay? I'm not muffled or anything. Okay, great. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, all right, can you see that okay? The slides, I believe if I click that, there we go, okay. Um, okay, so on this first slide, you can see an overview of the evolution of the policies on fossil fuels um, that banks have adopted since 2011. So you can see here, there is mention of exclusions for projects and for companies. Um, so exclusion of project finance is usually a first step a bank takes because the link between the bank and the project finance is clear and direct. Uh, whereas exclusions for corporate finance are still less common um, since it is more difficult for a bank to blacklist an existing or potential client. So up until 2015, no private sector bank had a policy excluding project finance for a whole fossil fuel subsector. Uh, this was despite years of campaigning. Um, the best some banks could do was restrict financing for the very worst of the fossil fuel industry, namely only some of the most polluting coal projects. So 2015 was of course the year of COP21, uh, which was expected to deliver an ambitious agreement on tackling climate change. So this opened a unique media opportunity to put pressure on banks to do better and gave campaigning more momentum internationally, for example, with the Paris Pledge campaign that BankTrack coordinated at the time. So this led to the adoption of the first coal mining sector exclusion policies among banks by Credit Ag Agricole and Bank of America, at their annual general meetings in the spring of 2015. Um, Credit Agricole followed up months later with a policy on coal power. So this move was due to a campaign by Friends of the Earth France um, to, stop their bank from, to stop the bank from financing the Plomancy coal power plant in Croatia. Um, so for France and Croatia, uh, BankTrack, CEE Bankwatch Network, and a local Croatian NGO, put out a report, the cover which you can see here, um, exposing the project's impacts and its incompatibility with the bank's own corporate social responsibility standards. And Faux France staged an action in front of a Credit Agricole bank branch, generating media coverage for the campaign. Um, so though Credit Agricole had earlier said that it would not immediately adopt a policy on coal power, they only withdrew from financing uh, so, uh, they withdrew from financing diplomacy, but then committed to ending financing for new coal power plants in developed countries as well. So you can see in, so this was the um, our, our news on it. Um, oh, I've lost a slide in there. Um, oh, no, this is the one. So you can see here a picture of activists um, at, the coals, uh, at the coal plant's proposed site. Um, a pretty slightly creepy and moving um, act of, uh, uh, action by Faux France, I think. Okay, so uh, these initial moves combined with good campaigning from our partners, such as Rainforest Action Network in the US or, um, and uh, Ergovold in Germany, 
led to a domino effect among the banks, with more and more of them adopting policies restricting both coal mining and coal power. So French bank Natixis and Dutch bank ING were the first to adopt worldwide exclusions on new coal plants. So this has since become the new standard um, for coal policies, with 12 banks having ended direct finance for both coal mines and coal, pul coal plants worldwide. Um, ING also committed more recently in 2017 to end financing for coal power companies by the end of 2025, making them the first bank to introduce such a time-bound commitment on corporate finance. So some strides have been made in coal, but there's still a lot of work to do, not only in coal, but also in oil and gas. Um, so policies with loopholes are an issue in some cases, as with HSBC's new energy policy, which was published in April. So the British bank has excluded financing for new coal and tar sands projects, but has exempted Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Indonesia from its coal exclusion until 2023. So the media reporting on the new policy didn't convey the fact that this loophole allows HSBC to continue financing new coal plants in three countries where there are massive coal expansion plans. Thus, what sounds like a minor exception turns out to be pretty significant. Um, a risk with such loopholes is that they can set a precedent for other banks to copy. So BankTrack is currently working with partners to push a fellow British bank, uh, Standard Chartered, not to follow HSBC's lead when they publish their new coal policy in September. Um, one other issue is that the withdrawal of some European banks from financing coal has led to an increase in Asian banks financing these deals in Asia. Uh, however, we have recently seen some Asian banks take their first small steps in the right direction. So three Singaporean banks excluded financing for the least efficient new coal power plants, while three big Japanese banks signaled earlier this year that they will restrict financing for new coal plant projects worldwide in some way. The latest move and sign of a domino effect is as recent as last Friday, with the first Japanese bank, Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Bank, committing to end project finance for new coal plants, world, coal plants worldwide, but with some exceptions which are yet to be clarified. So these banks still have a long way to go to bring their policies up to the standard we're seeing in Europe, but it's nonetheless encouraging to see moves in this key region. So in regard to oil and gas, things have finally started to happen in these sectors last year. Uh, Faux France, Rainforest Action Network and Save RGB, Rio Grande Valley, led a huge international campaign targeting BNP Paribas and its US subsidiary, Bank of the West, for arranging the financing of the uh, Texas LNG project. So this coalition of NGOs produced a report in March 2017, as you see here, um, detailing the impacts of the project and its violation of the equator principles, of which BNP Paribas is a signatory. This was followed by a speaker tour and actions at uh, Bank's annual general meetings in May, so here's some pictures from that. Um, and here uh, is some media coverage of it. And then in this slide, you can see Juan Mancias. Uh, he's the leader of an indigenous Texas-based tribe giving an interview about Texas LNG in the summer. I'm um, sorry, giving an interview about Texas LNG uh, on the main French radio station. So there was also a fact-finding mission on the ground in Texas in the summer and a series of impressive videos released by Faux France in September. And victory finally came in October uh, with the unprecedented move by BNP Paribas excluding financing not only for Texas LNG, but for unconventional oil and gas projects, namely shale gas, LNG, tar sands, and Arctic oil and gas, as well as excluding financing for some companies operating in these areas. So with several other banks, um, since then, several other banks have adopted policies excluding some financing for some extreme or unconventional oil and gas, mainly tar sands and Arctic projects. Um, but we're yet to see the same domino effect in oil and gas as we saw in coal. <clears throat> so the examples I've given so far of the wins on particular fossil fuel projects like Plomin C and Texas LNG, as well as the kinds of policies that banks have adopted on coal together indicate that the expansion of the fossil fuel industry is a particular issue. So indeed this year campaigners, well in the last couple of years really, um, campaigners have begun to focus their attention more explicitly on stopping the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, so for instance, last year BankTrack published the Banks versus the Paris Agreement report, exposing uh, recent bank financing for coal plant developers 
those companies still planning to build new coal, coal power plants around the world. Um, well, Rainforest Action Network uh, published a similar report exposing bank financing to the main companies expanding the tar sands industry. Claire, I'm yeah. just going to give you a bit of a time check um, okay. and ask you to start wrapping up. That would be great. Okay, sure. <laughs> Can do. Um, okay, so expansion is also part of the focus of Bank Track's upcoming campaign, Fossil Banks No Thanks, with our amazing logo here. Um, so instead of focusing on a single fossil fuel subsector, we'll be putting pressure on, um, on banks to end financing for all new fossil fuel projects and fossil fuel expansion companies. So in doing this, we're going to try and replicate that domino effect that we saw in coal in oil and gas, um, building on the move by BNP Paribas, but also by the World Bank, which announced in December that it would end financing for oil and gas extraction in 2019, something that campaigners have been working for for a long time. Um, I'll just go back to say. Um, so elsewhere in the financial sector, uh, huge opportunities for climate action act activism are emerging. So new alliances have recently formed between campaigns targeting fossil fuel finance by investors and insurance companies with big wins in both areas, such as with the Norwegian Pension Fund divesting from oil and gas companies um, and Allianz, uh, the insurer, committing to stop insuring and um, divest from most coal and tar sands companies. Um, so Allianz's coal policy came about as a result of work by Ergovold in compiling the global coal exit list and laying out clear exclusion criteria for coal companies. Okay, so from the outside, uh, it may seem sometimes like banks and other financial institutions are a bit uh, immovable and profit obsessed, but as Chihiro's talk uh, showed you, they can be moved with, with some sustained action and in some of the um, examples they've given you here. Um, so I'm just going to go to, to, in order to wrap up a little bit, um, say that there's uh, really good opportunities um, for activism within the financial sector. Uh, there's a lot of campaigns going on. There's a few examples that you can see here um, of campaigns targeting individual banks. Um, and there's larger ones such as uh, the Fossil Banks No Thanks campaign and 350s um, defund fossil fuels, which is much more grassroots um, and activist based and larger um, than any of those. So really a range of things to get involved in. Um, so just to sum up, the key messages uh, to remember when it comes to campaigning banks on their fossil fuel finance are uh, they're highly concerned about reputational risk and very sensitive to any mainstream and social media hit. They very closely track what their peers are up to so because they don't want to be laggards or they do want to be a leader. Um, and this can lead to the domino effect that we saw in coal. And they also pay attention to the reputations of the industries that they finance. Um, so in addition, some key campaign tactics that have been used successfully on banks are report writing and putting a public spotlight on the bank's role in financing the fossil fuel industry. Um, AGM interventions, uh, including bringing speakers around to tour them um, who are representatives of effective or indigenous communities. Uh, public actions at bank local branches or headquarters nationally and internationally, as we saw with ING on DAPL, um, and also insider lobbying with the banks through meetings, calls, and emails. So I hope this was useful. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on it. And um, if you want to contact me about any of this or about the Fossil Banks No Thanks campaign, if you want to get involved, then there's my email address. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, again, <laughs> what I, amazing. Oh. Am I still sharing my screen? You are. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna try to fix that. I'm not sure how currently. No worries. Um, but in the meantime, just a huge thanks for, for giving that in-depth overview. Um, it was very complimentary to what Chihiro was sharing in terms of we were able to see um, and hear about some of those tactics that have been used. Um, that groups have been the wide variety of, of groups that have been working and able actually to see uh, sort of the more collective power when when people all all across countries um, are are working together um, to have bigger impact. Um, so yeah, big thank you to you um, for that overview um, and to know also what work we're building upon um, that from others that have been setting example. Um, and also good to know what, where, we, where we've got to go to. 
um, and the other resources that are out there. Um, in the meantime, um, uh, just going to encourage people to. Um, so the Q and A um, is your chance now. If you if you've got any questions for for the speakers, um, you're you're very welcome to post them now. Um, we'd love to hear from you um, to go into more depth. I actually think maybe uh, Brett um, was writing in um, and had a had a question trying to clarify. Uh, I can't find the question. So maybe Brett, um, I think you're one of the few people who might be able to come off mic. Do you want to ask the clarification? Ah, I found it. Um, so Brett was actually wondering, maybe this is a, a question for Claire or Robbie, um, if you could clarify the difference between project finance, corporate finance, um, those sort of details, especially for folks like me who don't understand those differences. Yeah, my bad. That was supposed to be in my, I said to Claire that I would cover this in my presentation and I, I ran out of time. Um, maybe I could very quickly um, screen share again and try and be super quick to try and explain this. Is that all right? I'm going to do it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, great question. Um, and this is uh, where finance campaigning can get technical, but um, it's super important. I was particularly baffled by this term underwriting, um, which I'm going to come to. But firstly, the question project finance, and hopefully you can see my screen. Um, project finance means loans or underwriting for a particular project, um, such as a new pipeline. So it's project finance means uh, money for a particular project only. Um, underwriting means different things in different um, uh, circumstances, but in investment banking, um, it means raising capital through issuing shares or bonds um, for a project, uh, for a company. Uh, and in, sh in insurance, underwriting means guaranteeing payment in case of a financial loss. Uh, and the final definition which we have down here is that corporate finance means general loans to a company. Uh, and so that can be cr contrasted against project finance, which is for a particular project. I'll stop sharing there. Sorry that I didn't do that, cover that clear like I said I would. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, so I'm just going to share. Uh, can you hear me? I think that's okay. Um, just to share some of the comments coming in. So um, Shonan has said it's important to see also the role of governments um, that banks operate within a much larger financial system. We need to be. Uh, we need strong welfare states to effectively regulate banks. Um, in 2017, financing from G20 governments from over, for overseas coal projects reached a five-year high, totaling at least 13 billion US dollars in loans, credits, and guarantees. Um, thanks, Shonan, for that for sharing that information with us. Um, uh, and a question from Lenny: um, Does someone have have some information specific for or targeting Intesa Sao Paulo? Um, and maybe not, maybe that's, if anyone's got, if anyone can answer that immediately, great. Um, I, I would just say that um, we, we can talk about that if you want to email me, um, because they are one of the banks that we're um, planning to target, and we do have um, partners in Italy that we're going to potentially work with on that as well, so it might be good to follow up later. Great, thanks Claire. Um, Claire, maybe you can put, type in the chat box your contact details again um, so Lenny can get in touch with you. Um, and from Per Arheim um, is asking, while, while these actions are brave and justified um, and every impact on finance is encouraging, do we have good data on whether these projects find ways to get finance through other sources once those targeted have been discouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, um, 
I'll answer it in a second, but one of the things I forgot to mention also in my presentation that speaks to this question is that not only can defund campaigns pull the finance away, but the really valuable role in a big, huge, noisy public campaign like the one Shahira was involved in is to further delegitimize and stigmatize the fossil fuel industry and shift the political narrative over the longer term. And that is uh, almost as value, valuable as the financial intervention and pulling uh, some finance away from a company when the question is very justified. Maybe they go to, if the European banks stop financing it, maybe they go to the Asian banks instead. Um, but there's value in the political narrative changing. So a, a partial answer there. Maybe Claire can add more. Uh, yeah, I would just add, I think, as well, that um, part, part of why these protests are good is because they delay a lot of projects. And the more delay there is, the more expensive they become and the harder they are then to finance. So protesting projects generally is, is a good tactic um, ju just to make it more expensive. Great. Thank you both.